Number 55. Concrete is pumped from a cement mixer to the place it is being laid instead of being carried in wheelbarrows. The flow rate is 200 liters per minute through a 50 meter long, 8 centimeter diameter hose, and the pressure at the pump is 8 times 10 to the 6 newtons per square meter. Verify that the flow of concrete is laminar, taking concrete's viscosity to be uh, 48 newtons per square meter, and given its density, 2300 kilogram per cubic meter. All right, so this problem is fairly straightforward. Now, it seems like there's a lot of information here. Now, we don't actually need all this extraneous information. The reason why is because they gave us the flow rate, okay? Once they give us the flow rate, all of this other information, the 50 meter long pipe, the eight centimeter diameter, the pressure at the pump, all of it is irrelevant, okay? But, so I know sometimes that explanation isn't, you know, satisfactory, so why don't I show you why? All right. Now, if you just want the answer, feel free to skip. But if you want to learn something, stick with me. So they tell us the length of the pipe and they give us the gauge pressure, which is the pressure at the pump. So here's the pump. All right. The tubes connect to the pump and the concrete, you know, flows out and then is laid. So when they tell us the gauge pressure, remember, you got to remember that gauge pressure is essentially uh, the pressure inside of this tube, neglecting uh, any type of um, air pressure. All right, on the outside. So when we plug this these values into some equation, we're going to realize that we probably need a there has to be a, pre, a pressure differential in order for flow to even occur. All right, meaning that if the pressure here was eight times ten to the six newtons per square meter, and the pressure right here was eight point six, uh, excuse me, eight times ten to the six newtons per square meter, uh, no flow is happening. All right, you have to have a pressure a pressure differential in order for flow to happen. Now, in order to calculate the flow, then I know they gave it to us, but I'm going to show you that you I'm going to show you where this number comes from. So in order to calculate the flow, we have a couple of equations. All right. Now, this Pozwayi, I don't I think that's how you pronounce it. Don't ask me. Um, but here is his law. All right. His, his, his equation, I should say, for fluid flow. We have the that flow rate is equivalent to the change in pressure from one point to another multiplied by pi times the radius of the tube raised to the fourth power divided by eight times the viscosity of that fluid and then times the length of the tube. All right. So this should this formula should kind of make sense, right? The smaller the radius gets here, well, I drew the diameter, but the smaller the radius gets, right, the lower the Q value should be because there's more resistance. Okay, it's harder to pump something through a smaller tube than it is a larger tube. Similarly, right, the length, we can think about that, right, as length increases as this tube goes up, there's more resistance, right, there's more opportunity for these uh, particles to interact with the uh, surface or the inner lining of the tube, right, and therefore cause friction, reduce flow. Uh, more viscosity, meaning this is a thicker fluid, right, that would mean less flow. Okay, and a smaller pressure differential, as I just mentioned, if the pressure differential between the initial point, let's say the final point is zero, look what happens in your equation. This whole thing is zero. Do you get any flow? No. All right. So now let's see what the flow rate would be taking all of these variables into account. So we say that it's equal to the change in pressure multiplied by pi multiplied by the radius of the tube. All right, raised to the fourth power divided by then eight multiplied by the viscosity of that flowing fluid times the length of the tube. So we have all of these values, all right? Now remember the delta P or P2 minus P1, if I'm talking about gauge pressure, they gave me gauge pressure, delta P will be equal to just the gauge pressure. Why? Because I say that I'll just call this P2, it doesn't really matter. But if this is P2 and that's eight times 10 to the sixth, then P1 is zero, okay? Why? Because I'm neglecting essentially or taking out air resistance, uh, not air resistance, but air pressure from my equation. If they told you this is the absolute pressure, then what I would do is subtract then the atmospheric pressure at this point since the fluid is flowing out of the tube and now it's experiencing atmospheric pressure. So then this would have been 1.013 times 10 to the uh, fifth Pascal. But it told me gauge, so that's zero, okay? Now, times pi multiplied by the radius of the tube is going to be 0 0.08 all over 2. Where did that come from? Well, they told me 8 centimeters in diameter. So first thing I did was convert it into meters. 
all right? So that's 0 0.008. And then I divided it by two because I had to get the radius. They told me it was the diameter. So that's now raised to the fourth. Then divide this all by now eight. Eight multiplied by the uh, viscosity of the flowing fluid and they told it to us it's gonna be 48, right? 48.0. And then the length of the tube they told us was 50 meters. Okay, so let's plug this all into the calculator and let's see what we get. So we get eight times 10 to the sixth uh, times pi times then in parentheses, well, you can just do that in your head, right? 0 0.04 essentially, it works out to be raised to the fourth power. Then divide that now by in parentheses, eight times 48 times 50. And what do we get? So we get a Q value here of about 3.35. So 3.35 times 10 raised to the one two, minus three, right, minus three. And you might say, oh no, wait a minute. Oh, we made a mistake. No, we didn't. Okay, remember, these units here are cubic meters per second. So they gave us the flow rate in liters per minute. So let's see if this is equivalent to this by just doing a simple conversion. So take your cubic meter per second. We got to convert it into liters. So you know that for every cubic meter, there's going to be 1,000 liters. Okay. And then I got to get rid of the seconds. So they go on the top, minutes go on the bottom. 60 seconds in 60 seconds in one minute and say goodbye to seconds say goodbye to cubic meters and now you're left with liters per minute so this will be equivalent okay to the calculation so take that answer the 3.35 times 10 to the minus 3 multiply it by 1000 multiply it by 60 and voila right look at that what's the q now well you might say well the q is 201 well I, there, it's it, it's approximate, right? They just they made your life easier instead of saying two hundred one. They gave it to you as two hundred. But if you notice that they're basic, that they're the same thing. Okay, that's not coincidental. So what I'm trying to say is that if you look back to the prior problem we've done fifty four, and I'm saying that when you know the flow rate, all of the other information is basically extraneous, assuming certain assumptions that I made clear in that problem. As long as you know the flow rate through the tube, the problem is probably easier than you think, most likely. All right, I can't guarantee that. But in this problem, we don't need all of this information. We don't need it because they told us the flow rate. If they didn't tell us the flow rate, well, guess what? You can figure it out. All right, not a big deal. I mean, this would really be the value you would want to use, though. Okay, uh, so you would have had to have done a conversion anyway. So let me just do this. I'm going to erase this work. All right. So I'm going to just write the Q value at the top, the 3.35 times 10 to the minus three. All right. Cubic meters per second. I'm going to use this value, even though this comes out to be a slightly such a small, small fraction larger than what it, they actually told us it is. I'm going to use this value because this is probably actually more accurate than the rounded value they gave us up here. All right. Okay, so now let's erase this. Now let's move on to the actual question. All right, let's erase this too. So they want us to, cal it says calculate the Reynolds number. Okay, so here's the Reynolds number. So it says that the Reynolds number is going to be equivalent to 2 multiplied by the density of that flowing fluid. So this is concrete multiplied by the velocity of that concrete flowing through the tube multiplied by the radius of that tube divided then by the viscosity of that concrete. Okay. So now I know everything, right? We know the uh, uh, density. They told it to us. We know the radius. They told it to us essentially. We know the uh, viscosity, they told it to us. The only thing I don't know is the velocity. So now you're thinking, well, how can I find velocity? Well, Andrew, don't I need those other pieces of information? Nope, you don't. Why? Because you're thinking about how is velocity related to flow and, oh, it's related via this equation, right? It tells us then that the flow of the concrete will be equal to the area, a cross-sectional area, I should say, of the tube, all right? Uh, multiplied then by the velocity of the water. Uh, what, what am I talking about? Is there water in this problem? No. I'm just so used to doing problems with water. Times the velocity of that concrete. All right. This you can also say is the, the cross-sectional area of the two would be equivalent to that cross-sectional area of the flowing concrete. That's fine. You know, usually I'm using the C down. I'm keeping them consistent, but they're all the same. 
So solving this for the velocity of the concrete, it would be the flow rate of that concrete divided by the um, cross-sectional area of that concrete. So we know that that's a cross-section. The cross-section is a circle, so therefore this is divided by pi r squared. So now basically what we can do, right, is take this and then substitute it on in for this equation. So lo and behold, I know the flow rate. They told it to us. Remember, we're going to use this value, which is basically the same thing, it's, but I need it in the right units. I would have had to have done a conversion here anyway. Um, and I know the radius of the tube, and so we have everything. So now we can just plug it in, right? Let's just take that density. Let's plug this in. So this is QC all over pi uh, r sub c squared. This is divided by... Uh, sorry, multiply by the radius of the tube. Now here again, I'm using uh, different subscripts, but just keep in mind that this is the radius of the tube. I called this the uh, radius of the concrete, right? Uh, really, this is the radius of the tube or the concrete. They're the same, right? Because the concrete fills up this entire tube. So I apologize for a little bit of a, um, possible confusion there, but the radius of the tube, hopefully that's... You know, the radius, or let me say this, the cross-sectional area of the tube is equal to the cross-sectional area of that flow of concrete because the concrete fills up the entire tube. Andrew, how did you know that? I don't know. It doesn't say that, right? But I have to assume that. Right? There's a lot of assumptions, and that's also part of the difficulty with physics. That's why the more problems you do, the more you'll get used to what assumptions are made and what assumptions aren't made. Okay? Um... Then divided by the viscosity, right? So the viscosity was 48. Well, no, hold on. I didn't plug in any numbers yet. So here's the viscosity of that concrete. So now we're going to plug in the numbers. This is the uh, Reynolds number for the concrete. So this is 2 multiplied by the density, 2300, multiplied by, oh, and by the way, I can cancel this radius with one of these, right? So it simplifies the equation a little bit. Times in the flow rate. So we need it in the right units, 3.35 times 10 to the minus 3, all divided then by pi. Uh, multiplied by the radius, uh, which is going to be here, right? 0 0.08 over 2, which just works out to be 0 0.04. And then take that and divide it now by the viscosity of 48. And lo and behold, let's plug this on into the formula. I mean, we already did that into the calculator. So 2 times 2300 times then 3.35, 3.35 times 10 to the minus 3, Divided them by parentheses pi times 0 0.04. And then divide that now by 48. And what do we get? So we have a value here of approximately, so what do we have? 2.55, right? So this is going to be 2.55. Okay. And now that is, so it says, verify that the flow of the concrete is laminar. And this definitely is, right? I mean, this is a really, really low Reynolds number. Anything below 2,000 would be considered um, to be a laminar. Anything above 3,000 is considered to be turbulent. And then anything in between is kind of like, eh, kind of both, all right? Um, yeah, and the reason why it would be so low, if you think about it, is because the flow rate is pretty, is, uh, is well, the flow rate is fairly low. Also, the, the radius is a little bit on the larger side, but there's a couple of reasons why it is. But yeah, that's it. All right, guys. So I hope this video has helped you out. Uh, if it did, please help us out. Subscribe. Tell your classmates. All right. We appreciate it so very much. We appreciate your viewership, and we look forward to helping you with more problems. Take care.